Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to OzCastNetwork.com for details. The Word Docs would like to pay our respects to the Ghana people on whose lands we are today and to pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. And we would like to recognise that this is country of powerful storytelling and knowledges and that we're honoured to be here today. Welcome back to Word Docs. I am your host, Alex Vickery Howe. I'm here with Dr. Amy T. Matthews. Hello. And Dr. Sean L. Williams. Hello. Oh, very commanding. Oh, yeah. And uh, this is uh, this is Alex didn't do his homework because he was watching Yet the Dolly again. Parton musical again. Uh, well, not, not again. Dolly I mean, not, bit. Not, I've only watched <laughs> Dolly once, but the homework thing's reoccurring. Yeah, every week. Every, every week, week. I know. you've not done your homework. I know. I'm, I'm a bad kid. I was always a bad kid in high school too. You're setting a bad example for our students, of I course. I know. No, yeah, students don't listen. listen to this. Please get your essays in on time. Don't don't be like me. Do as I say. Not uh, when you're doing do. a seminar presentation. Prepare. <laughs> Prepare by going to the Dolly Parton concert. Well, Musical, if it's about musicals, that's fine. So what we're doing today is talking about... I just clicked my fingers then. I've still got Dolly Parton in my head. Like a, like a snap. like. Yeah, yeah. Mine's not snapping very well. See, oh, that's Is this good. the new clap? You we can, don't have to clap anymore. <laughs> we can snap. You can, can high snap. five. I mean, you can't high five, but you can snap. Yeah, can Shame snap. that no Goodbye one can see hands. jazz hands. <laughs> yeah, they're very good. There you so go. We'll do jazz hands. So I um, to the microphones. Believe it or not, we're not talking about musicals or jazz hands or choreography, although one day we should. Mm. Uh, but we're talking about um, our areas of interest, starting with me. And mine is uh, my my area of exegetical interest uh, was interculturalism, which is kind of sad to say, kind of a dead field. You know, when you go into academia and you contribute to a field and then the world moves on. Why is on. it dead? Why is, why is the world – can you – first of all, tell us yeah. what it is. Yes. Okay. Yes. And so then tell us how the world has moved on. Okay. So I'll, I'll tell you what it is and then you can forget it straight away because it's obsolete. Um, so with the, the core idea is still relevant and important, which is about how people from different nations and different cultural groups work together. Mm. That is still – Relevant. That seems hugely relevant hugely to relevant. the current Inter- geopolitical climate. Really Absolutely. Um, but interculturalism as a term uh, is kind of out of vogue. And so there's, there's several related terms. So there's transculturalism, transnationalism, I keep trans a lot in everything. Uh, cosmopolitanism. Mm. So, so the, the, broadly speaking, the differences are inter would be two cultures coming together. And so, you know, if, uh, the example from my working life is when I worked in Japan, we had a Japanese group and an Australian group working together interculturally. Once you start getting to the transnational and the transcultural, you're talking more about hybridization and um, global globalization and uh, less of that kind of dichotomy between us and them, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, hmm. Because what the, the kind of evolution from interculturalism was to start to talk about, well, actually – Maybe us and them isn't a useful framework. Maybe it's more, um, even though it was initially about working together in a positive way, which is a good thing, the, the, the next point that kind of emerged was actually most people are transnational or transcultural, which is to say you can live in Okinawa in a small village somewhere, but you're still on the internet and interacting with the world. Um, and I kind of experienced this when I went to Okinawa and um, – I was hanging out with some Japanese friends and they were eating hamburgers and I was kind of with the chopsticks <laughs> to, to, you know, eating an Asian lunch. Well, and I thought you trying to eat a, a hamburger with chopsticks. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, hilarious no. That is beyond my ability. So <laughs> you kind of go, actually, all of these stereotypes, that's a very weird um, example, but all of those stereotypes are actually much more complicated because our lives are much more culturally so, ingrained. I mean, what I find really interesting there, and I think we've seen it coming out with students, because I think a lot of our students are identifying um, that their research interests are around transcultural texts. But what I find really interesting is you mentioned the rise of kind of the internet and social media. Yeah. And this kind of global culture, like even the economic marketplace is global now, right? So everything is so intertwined. And Absolutely. you can get on Netflix and in one second be watching, you know, Western texts from Europe 
the US, Australia, New Zealand, but also be watching things from Korea, K-Tron. Japan, Russia, India, uh, yeah. China, India. Um, and so you're, the texts that you're taking in are really global in a way that they weren't even 10 years ago. That's and, right. And yeah. I guess we're looking at texts too uh, that aren't just from other countries but also different sections of our own community, so shows about people with autism or shows about people with disabilities. Is, does that fall under transculturalism? Not as culture well? as such, although, I mean, arguably, I mean, I think, you know, um, deaf culture is a culture, mm, right? Yes. I mean, you've, you've worked in that sphere and, and um, the, the thing that I became fixated on to the detriment of the whole PhD process, um, was generationalism. And the reason why it's a, it's a tricky one to run into is that I kind of think of academia as joining a club, right? Like you've got to, you've got to join the you've club. You've said that before. Yeah, I've, yeah. Said, I've often said But I joined it by burning the clubhouse, which I think I've said before as well. And what I mean is once you start talking about generational differences, you start critiquing... Um, the uh, the power base of your own supervisors, if you're not careful. Well, we are those people now. We like, are those I, people. I see my the students coming up because we're all Gen X, aren't we? Yeah, I'm on the cusp. You're on yeah. the cusp. Um, but they're, I mean, a lot of the students now are Gen Z. Mm. So they're like a couple of steps removed from us. And they are existing in a completely different cultural soup well, that's than I right. ever did. Yeah, and they use language that, that can be – there's a great book called Please Just F Off, It's Our Turn Now, by, written uh-huh. by right, – uh, When does Generation X get a turn? I mean, yeah. I know we're in positions of power right now, but I feel like Gen X has always been a tiny sliver of the we're just population. Kind of, yeah, we've got the baby boomers on one side and the young ones on the other. But in, the in this, young ones? The, young, the, the 30-year-old young, young the, the ones? The young whippersnappers. <laughs> but um, he wrote in his book how language is a cultural code and, and they can use slang to exclude or include. Yes. And it's very powerful when you, when you encounter students who are using words you don't know. And you go, oh, there's a cultural code I can't break into. But getting back to kind of the the national thing, what I became interested in was the intersection between nationality and generationalism and going, well, actually, what's the bigger divide here? Um, So when I was working in Japan, we all decided pretty quickly the bigger divide was generational because we had a linguistic national divide, which is to say we didn't speak the same language, but so many of our cultural references were the same. I think it's different again now, though, because I don't think it's about generationalism anymore so much as about which little niche you're in, right? Yeah, well, then you get to subcultures and it gets... Yeah, because yeah. I, I think with the explosion of TikTok and social media and having an online kind of world, those niches are where you live. So yes. if you're into K-drama... That can be people from the age of like 12 right up to 60. That's right. And these fandoms kind of exist as cultures. Like they have their own <laughs> their own languages, their own costumes, their, their own conventions, code, yeah. their own everything. Yes. And they're quite impenetrable the way a, a different culture can be. And this is why I asked, I remember, I, I think it's in the final version of my thesis, I, you know, to give the background, we went to Japan to, to work on this collaboration, um, six Australian actors, six Japanese actors, a Japanese producer, Australian director, me as the writer, Japanese choreographer, this whole kind of group. And my job in terms of the theory was to talk about cultural difference. But the alliances made in that room had little to do with which country you were from. Mm. And the way I phrased it in the in the thesis is I said, okay, we've got 20-somethings and 30-somethings, 40-somethings, 50-somethings, 60-somethings. We have people who are deeply religious. We have people who are outspoken atheists. We have vegans. We have ex-Goths. We have conservatives. You know, I, I did this whole list and then I said, now let's talk about culture. Yeah. And, of course, what you realise is that there are alliances made – because of all those other reasons that are that are deeply, um, before we get even to gender and sexuality, there are alliances made on all of those other things because for many people, national identity is important, but it's probably not the first thing for us. I think for a lot of people it's about gender, sexuality. For me it's probably political alignment. Um, so is this partly the religion. privilege of peace though? Sorry? Like, is this partly a privilege of peace? That's a good point. Thinking about what's happening in the world right now, the minute you just destabilise peace, the minute you're at war or in conflict, does nationalism reassert itself? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And it, not even that. The minute you take um, – the most nationally inclined people are the ones who are outside 
of their home. Mm. So the minute you take any of us out of our home, our national identities become a more powerful marker. So yes, times of conflict, times of, of upheaval. Um, but at the same time, I think it's it's probably reductive to just think of us in terms of our nationalities. And a lot of the writing at this stage, we're going back a long time, was just fixated on nationality. And a lot of young people went, well, hang on, I'm more than my nationality. I mean, that's part of me. But my faith or my... Sport. Sport. My, you know, <laughs> that's right. My, my subculture, whatever that is, you know, my, my gender identity. I know you boys will be watching the sports ball finals this weekend. <laughs> yeah. Sean and I watching the yeah. sports ball finals <laughs> that's, co- that's correct. Um, we're, we've, uh, we're going to sit around in our sports ball uniforms <laughs> yes. uh, and cheer at our favourite sports ball and, and not mention Doctor Who once. Oh, no. Dear me, no. That's for nerds. <laughs> I, I, I actually love sports. So I'm not gonna, I'm gonna be quiet there. So I did my homework and I do have some questions. Oh, this is why Amy's... Because <laughs> I'm a know, SWAT. She's a SWAT. I didn't used to be. I was a terrible student, but I'm, a, I'm okay now. <laughs> so I want to ask you about questions of power mm. and about, um, I guess, transculturalism... And questions of power. So if we mm. have things like Disney or superheroes, right, mm. we've had the colonisation of American culture throughout the world and often that has happened after conflict, right? So it's it's the American army, the US army occupying Japan, Japan, Japan. occupying mm. Germany, having bases here in Australia during World War Two, and starting to disseminate their culture and then doing it through popular arts, right, which we all three of us are really interested in. Yes. Is this idea of using music, comic books, novels, um, films, television shows to kind of disseminate a culture. So we've had the UK as an imperial kind of cultural force, Europe, the US, and we have spent, you know, a lot of time in the last decades thinking about power and appropriation Mm. and not erasing. So being a, a white Australian, maybe being very conscious not to appropriate an indigenous voice or a or a position where I could eclipse somebody. Yeah. Absolutely. And those concerns are still hanging around. But I've had students lately who are really interested in writing, I keep mentioning them, K dramas. Mm. Yes. Um, and this idea of if you think about Bollywood or you think about um, K drama, K pop, that whole K wave, or Japan, if you think about anime and manga, mm. if you as like if me as a white Australian person decided to write into those, what is that dynamic now? Because has the power, who has the power in that situation? I would say con- from, from that experience, the major mistake I made was thinking that it was us and that was an mm. incredibly arrogant mistake, um, you know, and, and a mistake that I had to adapt to. So if you can imagine I'd done all this reading about interculturalism, all this reading about how to politely engage, how to not be... Um, oppressive, how to not... Um, Be the ugly in- American tourist exactly. kind of type. Mm-hmm. How, how not to fall into cultural misappropriation. And within a few weeks, because um, I was so so uptight, uh, unlike a lot of the other actors and people involved, I, w- I was really uptight. And so I would only communicate through a translator until some of my Japanese friends went, just le- they deliberately got the translator drunk, in fact, so he couldn't do it. And they said, are you being a bit racist by only speaking through a translator? Like, just deal with us, deal with us face to face. And then I sort of explained, I said, well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit uptight about all of these issues. And they went, you're from Adelaide. Yeah, we're from Tokyo. We're from Tokyo. And they, and cause they, they <laughs> Who was, are you, you provincial boy? That's exactly yeah, right. right. And they were speaking kind of broken English, but so brilliantly. Like they'd go, oh, I'm just a poor person person from the small city of Tokyo <laughs> I can't possibly hold my own against you know someone from the grand metropolis of Adelaide you know and um and they turned all of that on its head and, and basically said how dare you how mm. dare you assume you arrogant white yeah person. yeah how dare you and then all of these assumptions get like because we talked about yellow face so so their rule very clearly very explicitly was we will offend each other so let's just do it mm. let's just tell each other what's in our mind and so some one night at the bar it got to yellow face and um, someone else was raising it and saying how offensive it is. And the Japanese people were like, why? And we're like, well, obviously if we do that, we're kind of sending you up. And they went, yeah, but that just means you want to be cool like us. (laughs) And so all of that was kind of flipped. Plus there's a very strong deliberate soft power movement in countries like Japan to put the manga and the anime out there in the same way that Disney 
and these other corporations. And it's it's very conscious that they 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 have a strong impact. So that's where I think my research hit a major wall because I went in with all of these assumptions and they turned around and went, nah, nah. <laughs> and they um they were quite explicit about deconstructing that. But, of course, that's a Japanese perspective. And, and Jap- we do also want to interrupt here just to mm. say that Alex is quite aware. He's talking anecdotally about yeah. one small group yeah, of Japanese right. people. So don't be writing into us going, Alex is talking about all Japanese No, of people. course that's not. Right. Cultures aren't monolithic. Of course not. And that's the other thing that the research runs into because I think the danger is with a lot of Western writing about – I don't even like the expression Western, but, you know, Eurocentric writing about other cultures mm. is that we do treat them as monolithic. Mm. And we do treat them in a lot of the academic writing – as if we have power, without actually acknowledging, um, particularly in, a ca- in the case of a place like Japan, that was an imperial power, mm. that, that is a very powerful nation. So um, you're in that weird balancing act of not wanting to speak for, not wanting to um, do anything that sort of slips into that cultural appropriation, but at the same time not wanting to fall into the trap of thinking – that that's the lens through which this engagement is going to be seen. So mm. I um, am going to just preface this by saying I've been reading honors theses mm-hmm. um, the last two days, and the last two I read were both talk about Edward Said's Orientalism. Yeah. So that's where my brain is at right now. But the idea that um, that dichotomy set up by the West between West and East is a total construct. Yes. Mm. Is very hard to actually get your head around when it's been naturalised. Absolutely. And the idea that if we take away that othering, that completely changes the way you think about transculturalism because the othering, that setup of East versus West, comes with an inherent privileging of West. Yeah, it does. And and I that's why I would never I, – in my thesis I had to use East and West – building from that book, but I always did it in quotation marks because I was never huh. comfortable saying it. And and the play that I did was in the Oz Asia Festival, which again, and I and I, you know, it's a great festival, but the trap of that festival is that Oz Asia reinforces an East West dichotomy, particularly in the beginning where Oz was written in Times New Roman and Asia was written in kind of brush strokes. Mm. And people were saying, well, that's actually creating, even though the festival's about building a bridge, it's creating a divide even in its construct. And there are a number of people there going, what if you're what if you're both of those things? Exactly, yeah. And then you go, am I, am I an Oz Asian? Like, what the hell's this? You know, and my friends, I won't name them, but a few friends of mine who were in that position were going, I hate this divide. I hate this implicit divide in the festival because it's reducing our experience and it's reducing our identities. And so it's it's paradoxically doing exactly the thing it was constructed to, mm. to build a bridge through, if so that makes sense. As Australians, I feel like... Transculturalism is quite an interesting thing to think through yes. because you're kind of born into a country where there is this colonial, we're settler colonists, mm. so there's like a colonial heritage there and a, a, a cultural imaginary, like you step into an imaginary space that is English, but then also we have the waves of immigration that have coloured that space, right, like Irish, um, Chinese, German, Vietnamese, um, Italian, Greek. Mm. Like we have all these waves of immigration that have Mm. contributed to the cultural imaginary. And then we have the US and Europe and now the different um, Asian cultural imaginaries where it's Japan, China, Korea, Vietnam, Thailand. Um, So we have this kind of imaginative space that is so transcultural, right? Mm. But not perfectly so. It's a bit of a mess. Um, but what I'm seeing my students struggle with, all right, simple example. Um, again, I've been reading honours <laughs> theses, so if any honours students recognise <laughs> some of these thoughts, I've probably been talking them through with them. Um, one is like, say I'm reading Lord of the Rings or mm. watching The Rings of Power, which came out this year. That is a very English imaginative space, right? Tolkien mm. has taken this mythology and also Norse mythology and um, other kind of Northern European mythologies and he's created this imaginary space that is drawn from that, that we all step into. We're all really familiar with it. And people who love it, who cosplay as elves or cosplay as dwarves or whatever, are stepping into a cultural imaginary space that is transcultural to us, right? Mm-hmm. Mm. Then if you pick K-dramas, you might be here as a white Australian person in Adelaide, but 
your entire imaginative space is South Korean. Mm. Yes. And yeah. that's really interesting. That's entirely it possible. Is. And I mean, um, it's difficult from a kind of novelist perspective. And when, when you're working as a playwright, I think, I think the ethical implications are quite clear. It's like we need to be in the room together to create something. And the, not so much the actors, but all of the heads of department need to be culturally diverse. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's really important. Um, but, yeah, when you're writing just a novel, and And if, that if line? the power is not – I mean, there are power levels of power, right? But the, the Korean wave is massive and mm. it's a multi-billion dollar kind of mm. thing. And so where is the – where are the kind of shades of grey between writing into the K-drama space as a white Australian person versus writing into the Disney space mm-hmm. or the, you know, Marvel universe or um, into Lord of the Rings? Where is the difference in writing into these genres in a globalised transcultural kind of world when maybe power is not such an issue? It's very tricky. I mean, I would still argue you've got to, I mean, I dumped myself in Japan for months and just survived. And I think that there's got to be some level of either intense research. What if it's a fantasy space though? Like what if it's not writing about the real world, but it's, um, I don't know, like Japanese robots in the 23rd century kind of anime space. Star Wars. I I would argue. Star Wars is a great example. Yeah, Yeah, I was going to mention Star. I would would argue that fantasy mythology is still linked to cultural identity. But what about... If you're a Japanese person writing into the Marvel Universe mm-hmm. or yeah. a Korean person writing into Disney or Star Wars, because that happens, like a lot of people have done that, right? Yeah, of course. Yes, more and more now. In and Marvel. a lot of animated shows are made in South Korea. Yes. I still think you need to link it, if, if not physically by travelling, then through research. You have to link it to the origin and have some sense of that. It's not that you have to be slave to that. But where's the origin for... Captain America. What do you? What would you do if you were from Korea and you were hired to write the next Captain America film? Would you well, you'd to go, go to ba- America. You'd <laughs> go. You, well, you'd go back to the the original source comics, which were kind of propagandist. But where do you like? If we take take Thor: Love and Thunder, right? Yes. So you've got Thor, which is the <laughs> Norse god, or yes. whatever, right? Or yeah. whatever. Link whatever. Modern phrase. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, it comes from the American comic. And yet it is written and directed by a uh, Maori Kiwi. Guy from New Zealand, yeah. With an Australian from Byron Bay starring in it. Like yeah. this is globalised transculturalism, right? But I'd still say that the writers of those works, I mean, yes, it absolutely 100% is. But I, I would I would still argue that to do, if 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 we were commissioned to do a Thor movie or, or whatever, I would still want to go back to some source stuff. And would you go, dress up as Thor? No. Can, can that Loki be a picture on maybe at a stretch. <laughs> but like you'd, you'd have to go Pick back. who was the ex-goth in that Japanese story before. <laughs> <laughs> you'd have to go back and I think you'd want to know about Ragnarok and Valhalla. You'd, you'd do all that reading. But I would do that reading partly because I'd be really into it. Yeah. That would be part of the pleasure of, reading, of it. The bulk of your reading in Mr. All right, what about Marvel. Superman, Alex? Would Superman, you go to Krypton? <laughs> I would go to Krypton. No, I would... <laughs> I would go back to... Um, some of the origin, because uh, just yesterday we were in a lecture about the origin of Superman and various comic books. And so oh, I would go back to that. Yeah, I'd go back to some of that research and go, where did it start? I want to go back to where it started. Well, okay, what about Mickey Mouse? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're going to find one. I'd, I'd want to go back to where it started. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So you, you're into the, the um, hermeneutics of recovery, Alex. Oh. Uh, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that doesn't sound very sexy. Can you take, can you take a drink for that? Because <laughs> I just think that's part of the fun. Like, you've got to go and immerse yourself in where did this start? Before people started riffing on it, where did it start? And if I'm going to riff on it, I want to riff on it. Um, All right. So then, with here, a sense of grounding and here, what you're getting of, at is yeah. authenticity, some sense of authenticity. Yeah. But isn't that a construct too? Yes. And it aren't is. we, aren't we it dealing with intercultural relationships across time then? So, Superman in the 30s yeah. is responding to a very different culture than the same country 90 years later. We well, straight away you think of Red, is it Red Sun? The comic yes. where Superman went to Russia instead. Yes. Like these kinds of things, I think, are really clever, but they depend on an understanding of what Superman originally was in order to subvert it culturally. Um, Because you have to understand Superman's American propagandist origins to understand that if you then place him in Russia 
what that looks like, right, or how that works. Mm. And when you um, look at Superman by Zack Snyder from 10 years ago, that's a very different kind of Superman from 80 years earlier. Mm. And I wonder if the Zack Snyder is, is, is an authentic response, cultural response, to the present day, which is and the the past being a whole other country. Well, yeah, this is kind of getting back to the generational thing, like because I mm. think ultimately where I came to is that all of this stuff is an intersection between time and place. Mm. Really, it's mm. it's you know it's it's a time intersecting with a with a with a nation um, or a group of nations or or intersecting nations. Interesting, just sidebar that kind of illustrates the point. When we were in Okinawa doing this show, um, you know, rural Okinawa is quite far out. And so the physicality of Western bodies or, you know, Aussie bodies on stage with Japanese people really struck that audience as important. And mm. all of the audience feedback was, isn't it great? We're all sharing together. Isn't it wonderful? I, w- I was saying to Sean the other day, I met an elderly man on the way to the train station who talked to me always in English. Always trains with you. Always. always trains. Was he a Scientologist? You no. Know, Did he no. have a daughter that he wanted you to marry? Actually, there is another story. I was nearly was picked a pirate? up. I was nearly picked up in Shinjuku oh. by a Japanese guy who wanted me to go to a Catholic church and clean my feet. I didn't do that. But this other a guy specific <laughs> that was. <laughs> but this other guy in Okinawa talked to me for ages and then said, "You're the first person I've spoken to since the Second World War," which was really this beautiful, moving kind of rainy day moment. That is the surrealest thing you yeah. may have ever said. It's like Alex. a Miyazaki film, right? But can I just the, the core point before we wrap up? In Okinawa, Aussie bodies with Japanese people, big deal. And the Japanese actors were really excited at the thought of coming to Adelaide because they said, we'd be the Gaijins. We'll be, we'll be really unusual. And I said, oh, not no, so not so much. You know, you won't be. And they were so disappointed that, that because uh, Adelaide is, compared to Okinawa, far more multicultural, they were really upset. They were like, oh, we're not, we're not, we're not alien and special <laughs> here. We're Where just could you have taken them? Like Georgia or somewhere? <laughs> Georgia, <laughs> America, not Georgia. The <laughs> well, even, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, can I just... Bring one last point that I sure. find quite interesting thinking about this is Sean mentioned Star Wars. Mm. Um, so, Sean, you writing Star Wars or Doctor Who mm. coming from Australia is a transculturalism because I write yes. obviously in the Wild West and that's a transculturalism too. Yeah, for sure. That's right. And, in fact, Australian authors do really well in both the UK and the US markets because we have both cultural imaginaries present here. Yes, I'm sure that's true. That's really interesting. Was it um, JK wouldn't let any non-English actors into Harry Potter? That was a thing. Oh. She was very possessive about that. So and same with Doctor Who. Doctor Who is very culturally constrained. So they'll never English have an American actors. writer. Well, the French right. do that, don't they? I think they, there's an Australian writer. There was an Australian writer who wrote for Doctor Who recently, right? Um, at the TV show, and there were a couple of Australian novelists back in the nineties. Did they have the the what's it called the heritage passport? Yeah. <laughs> Possibly, uh, must have surely. <laughs> Yeah, interesting. I think Alex has forgotten his hosting. No, film. I'm going to wrap up. I'm going to wrap up. They don't. They don't trust me here, good no, people. No, he doesn't do his homework. Um, Why would we trust you, Alex? <laughs> but it's a very interesting. And look, I think a lot of these, like most academic problems, are kind of unsolvable, but Absolutely. they're interesting to play with. I think is the well, is the, the unanswerable yeah. questions of the yeah. eternal teasing ones. out the shades of grey is really interesting. Yeah, not you're not talking about. <laughs> well, that is also an area of study, my it friend. Teasing sure out the is. shades of grey. Yeah. Um, all That's right, well, book seven in the series. <laughs> whipping it into shape, I think oh. it would be a better joke. Why does it always You're end with a dead bondage? horse now. <laughs> um, well, to wrap it up, I'm going to have to say the thing that I hate saying, but happy writing. Happy writing. Happy writing. We should say this act, though, in different languages. Uh, Bols, oh, uh, oh. Scribe, or whatever in French. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> It's not going to be totally wrong. <laughs> Scriven is something, something. <laughs> See you, everyone. Bye. Why don't you write when you don't need money? All your notes sound alike too much. All of them start with I love you, honey, but they end with the same old touch. Just for a change, send a nice loving letter and cut out that please remittance. Why don't you write when you don't need money, honey? That would certainly make a hit. And now I am recording now, but I promise oh, not to use God. that bit. You've said that before. You've said, oh, I, pro- I then, won't use that I don't bit. use it, though. Oh, I don't know. I've heard some of those outtakes. <laughs> some of them are pretty bad. So I'm just, um, Alec, uh, let's just.
talk normally. La 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 la. Oh, normally. That's normal. Hello, hello. That is actually how you talk normally. So, <laughs> yeah. hello, speak, hello. Speak, speak hello. to me. Hello. Yeah, this no. happened to me last time. You know. <laughs> yeah. He's not even got his headphones okay, on, again, Sean, so again, it's hard to again. know. Go. Okay, what about now? Can you hear us? Maybe There's I no suffer. Test, um, really. It's called fifth syndrome. My dentist introduced me to fifth syndrome, which is customer is fucked in the head. And whenever the, whenever the dentist says to his nurse, I believe this patient has fifth syndrome. Oh, now I know what he's saying when he says it. <laughs> um, I think that's a very sad thing. Fifth. Why fifth? <laughs> fifth. Fucked in the head. Oh, fifth. Shouldn't oh, fifth. it be fucked yeah. in the tooth? <laughs> well, because often they'll say like, Can you hear us hurt? now? Is that what's happening? Have we sorted this? No. Nah. Oh, God. I bet if I – oh, Jesus, that's really loud. Whoa. Um, what about um, – Oh, that's ooh. very loud. Oh. That's deafening. That's, that's oh. your volume control. So this must be Alex. Okay, let's try Oh, that oh, shit. Oh. <laughs> yeah. That's like, where he's just happy. the volume. Never happy. It's just okay. the volume. Can, can you just Have you tried turning it on and off? <laughs> just go up again a little bit. Hello? Hello? Hello, hello, hello. Hello. That's better. About, oh, just a little bit under that. Under. Sure, you're not deaf. Yeah. There. He might be yeah. deaf. He's oh. been a drama student. He's probably oh been God, near big Amy. speakers. <laughs> lucky for you that Sean knows sign language. Yeah, but, <laughs> Unfortunately, not, you don't. Yeah, how is that lucky for me? <laughs> <laughs> okay. All, All right. right. All righty. Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to oscastnetwork.com for details.